having our communion service today, and we are going to pick up on that little bit of Acts 20, 28 that I wanted to talk about. We have uh, skipped over this one phrase, and I haven't said much about it in all of our discussions, uh, and it is it fits very well with communion, so I thought I would make it our subject this for this afternoon. So here's the phrase, be on guard for yourselves and all for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And it is that last bit, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood that I call to your attention. It sounds very familiar or similar to something we've been looking at in uh, 1 Peter uh, recently, Last week it was, knowing, uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now, <clears throat> the our word in uh, Acts twenty twenty eight where it says, he has purchased with his own blood, is somewhat different from the word redeemed in verse 18 of First Peter. This word, purchased, means to gain possession of something, to acquire, to obtain, to gain for oneself, uh, to acquire possession of something with the probable component of considerable effort, to acquire, to achieve, to win. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity in our text which makes it intriguing and helps us to think about our salvation and our Savior. And when you see this phrase, the church of God which he purchased with his own blood, obviously the passage is referring to the death of the Lord Jesus as the great effort that was needed uh, to acquire the church of God. All right? However, if you notice there, we have an uh, impersonal pronoun. We have he, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Who is the he? That's the question. It isn't absolutely clear who the he is. Now, grammatically, it's relatively clear that we would think the he would point back to God. And uh, most of the translations make the choices in this text pointing in a certain direction. But the Greek does leave it a little bit ambiguous. And uh, there, the alternatives that are, uh, in trying to understand this phrase, point to profound truths about our salvation. So I thought it's worth our consideration. So, first of all, the natural understanding raises... A question. The natural way to take this passage is that the he refers to God in Church of God. So we could say the Church of God, which God purchased with his own blood. But the question, does God have blood? That's what the scribes who were copying this text out were wrestling with. This doesn't sound quite right. God doesn't have blood. God is a spirit. And your mind may already be going to a solution to that question, to this problem, but many of the copyists found this a troubling question. So it produced, in fact, a textual variant. We have a textual variant in this passage. Now, I've given you here a couple of things. God is theos in Greek. Now, you don't read Greek, but that you see that symbol with the, that circle with the line through it? That's the TH sound, and then it looks like an E, so E-O-S, that's what that's supposed to be. And then on the other hand, you have Lord, which is kurios, so it looks like a K-U, that's actually an R-I-O-S, okay? So that's how those work. Now, in the manuscripts, so when they're copying out in those early manuscripts, I don't know if you remember this. I've talked about this years and years ago. But in most of the early manuscripts, they did it all capital letters. Okay, So you had a line of all capital letters. And in some of them, they didn't have spaces between words. So you just had to know how to read it. 
And they also, for certain words, would use shorthand. So here's the shorthand. These are capital letters, and they're using the, uh, it's a, the genitive ending. So it, has, it looks like a Y there at the end. And you see the circle with a line through it. So that one is the shorthand for God. Okay, that one is. And so the other one is the shorthand for Lord. So the manuscripts, these early manuscripts, where there's this variant, the only change is one letter. See, they put the two, the beginning and end letter, put a little line across it. That meant this is shorthand. Okay? So they, so, so when it comes down to it, wit, they're changing one letter. And the question is, Church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood, or the Church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, it's interesting here, in this particular situation, the King James Version, which often goes against these, the very old manuscripts, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, the King James Version actually follows them against the majority text in this verse. So, it's just a curiosity. It's very interesting. So, how, how do we support the notion... Church of God, because most of the translations follow this, including the King James. Well, here's the reasoning. The, uh, the phrase church or assembly of the Lord, uh, that would be in the, he- in the Hebrew, it would be Yahweh. And so as they're translating that into Greek, they would put kurios, church of the Lord, in the Old Testament Translated into Greek, the Greek version of the Old Testament occurs seven times. That phrase occurs seven times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It never occurs in the New Testament, other than perhaps this one. Now, the Church of God, that phrase, occurs 11 times in Paul's epistles. And then the Churches of Christ, once in Romans 16.16. So, there's... Either a scribe changed it from Church of God to Church of the Lord, or they changed it from Church of the Lord to the Church of God. Those are your two choices. So if the Lord was original, then possibly influenced by Paul's epistles, they changed it to God. Or if God is original, possibly influenced by the Old Testament, they changed God to Lord. You see? So there's a little bit of... That doesn't really help us. There's the, the evidence from the Testaments doesn't really help us. Now, some will argue for Lord, Church of the Lord, since that is a more rare phrase in the New Testament. So they think, well, that's not usually what's used in the New Testament, so it makes this a little bit harder, a little bit more unusual, so it's probably original, Church of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? But the problem is that God is a harder reading because of the question, does God have blood? Does God have blood? If Lord were original, no one would say, does the Lord have blood? Well, of course he has blood, right? He's a man as well as God. So consequently, Church of God is overwhelmingly accepted by the translators, including the King James Version. Now, so the first thing to understand is how, what is the text saying, or what is the actual text? So we're going to say Church of God is the actual text here. All right, so Acts 20, 28. Let's look at that phrase again. The Church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So the natural understanding is, I think, the great understanding. This is Church of God. But does God have blood? And who is he? And what is this text saying about our Lord Jesus? So that brings us to point two. There is a solution that is proposed by some on this. Now, I don't want to get into all the grammar of this. You're just going to have to accept some of my statements as I work through this. But um, the phrase could be understood this way, as the church of God, which he, God, purchased with the blood of his own. Okay? So it separates out that last word and makes it pointing to the blood of Jesus, but God purchased salvation for us 
with the blood of his own, with the blood of his precious um, son. He is taking, interpreting it this way, we're taking an adjective, his own, to stand for a noun. We're using it as a noun. And that is, you can use that word as a noun. That's legitimate. So let's take that as, for the time being, let's take that interpretation as correct. So salvation by the beloved Son. Salvation by his own. The church of God which he purchased with the blood of his own, of his own precious Son. So let's consider some things that would emphasize the preciousness of the Son of God. How often do, do we hear the words, my beloved son? So at the baptism, Matthew 3.17, and also in Mark 1.11 and 3.22, Behold a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So that's recorded at the baptism. And then at the transfiguration, we talked about that in our Bible study this morning, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It's very interesting. God has this perspective or this focus on the Son. And then Matthew 12, 6. This is the parable of the tenants. And it says, He had one more to send, a beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, They will respect my son. Remember the parable is about the father who sends first his servants, and they stone them and beat them and send them away. We won't give them the rent. And so finally he sends, he's one more to send, his beloved son. And he sent him last of all to them, saying, they will respect my son. And so this parable is meant to display the relationship God has with his own very special son, whom he loves and who he sends to the earth. And then there's one more reference in 2 Peter 1.17. Peter is talking about the transfiguration, and he says, When he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So the thing is this. God the Father so loved the Son, that he specially designated him as his beloved. And this is he who he sent into the world. The church of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own, his very own son, with his beloved son. And with this we can understand John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God purchased our salvation with the blood of his precious Son. So it speaks to us about the love of God, the sacrifice of God for the salvation of our souls. God loved us so that he was willing to give his most beloved So that's one thing we can think of when we think of this phrase. And there's another way of thinking of it. And that is salvation by God the Son. And I kind of have a little bit of trouble with making this read, this adjective read as a noun. In other words, where where some are taking this, uh, the church of God which he purchased with the blood of his own. Sort of uh, grammatically it's possible, but it It just doesn't ring right to me. And most of the translations take it the way we have it in our version, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, this translation is good grammatically, but still we have to ask this question, because does God have blood? And the answer is, God the Son has blood. God the Son has blood. And A.T. Robertson gives this very blunt and forceful comment. Through the agency of his own blood. Whose blood? If the reading of God is correct, as it is, then Jesus is here called God who shed his own blood for the flock. It will not do to say that Paul did not call Jesus God, for we have Romans 9.5, Colossians 2.9, and Titus 2.13, where he does that very thing, besides Colossians 1.15-20 and Philippians 2.5-11. 
So he makes a very important statement here. Jesus, our God, shed his own blood for his church. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed his own blood for the flock. This is a very powerful statement of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very powerful statement of his commitment to his church. He died for it. Now, both of these interpretations are correct theologically, and, but only one is correct for the passage. Like, you could take it either way. We are saved by God the Father through his own very beloved Son who loved us and gave himself for us. And that is true. Regardless of what this text is actually saying, that is true. But even more powerfully to my mind, we are saved by our very own God, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood, his own blood for us. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. To me, that is... I, I favor the second interpretation. It's not one that we're going to argue with somebody about if they disagree, but I'll tell you, there's a great deal of power in this. God the Father loved us so that he would send his Son, but the Son, the Son, our God, paid for our salvation with his blood. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As we celebrate communion this afternoon, uh, again, we always ask for parents to be uh, supervising, but if you know the Lord and have uh, followed him in baptism, then you should feel free to take part. And so we will, uh, uh, we will be distributing that in just a moment. I will ask Colin and Cam to come in a moment, but first I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for what you have done for us in saving us from our sins. We thank you. For the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that as we worship you with this communion service, that we would be mindful that it is the beloved Son who saved us and also our true God who saves us from our sins. Lord, I pray that you would stir us up in our hearts to follow you faithfully each step of the way. In Jesus' name.